Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in tonight. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan, the Miami Book Fair, and all of us at Books and Books, I welcome you to a virtual evening with Eric Weiner to discuss his new book, The Socrates Express, In Search of Life Lessons from Dead Philosoph Philosophers, published by Avid Reader Press. Eric Weiner combines his twin passions for philosophy and global travel in a pilgrimage that uncovers surprising life lessons from great thinkers around the world. From Rousseau to Nietzsche, Confucius to Simone Weil, traveling by train, he journeys thousands of miles, making stops in Athens, Delhi, Wyoming, Coney Island, Frankfurt, and points in between to reconnect with philosophy's original purpose teaching us how to lead wiser, more meaningful lives. Eric is an award-winning journalist, best-selling author, and speaker. His books include The Geography of Bliss and The Geography of Genius, as well as Man Seeks God and now The Socrates Express. He's a former foreign correspondent for National Public Radio and reporter for The New York Times, as well as a regular contributor to The Washington Post. BBC Travel, and Afar, among others. In conversation with Eric tonight is Thomas Swick. Tom was the travel editor of the South Florida Sun Sentinel for 19 years. His work has appeared in six editions of the best American travel writing, and he's the author of three books, the latest being The Joys of Travel and Stories That Illuminate Them. Recently, he's been drawing cartoons, which he talked about last month on WLRN. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by clicking the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen, and we'll get to those right after their talk. You can find the Socrates Express for purchase at Books and Books below by pressing the green button. Every purchase you make helps keep Books and Books up and running during these difficult times, so press away. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the screen. Here you are, Eric. Hello. And welcome, Tom. Hi. Hi. Well, Eric, uh, welcome. It's it's good to see you, uh, even if it's only on the screen. And uh, I'm thinking this this should be interesting because uh, you're talking with someone who's never even done a Zoom meeting. So uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll, this is dangerous. We'll, we'll see how this goes. Um, first of all, I, I just want to congratulate you on just a, a, a marvelous book. Um, I I I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, I found it informative, entertaining, edifying. Uh, timeless and timely at the same time, which I, I want to talk a little bit, a bit about. But so to begin, um, why don't you just tell us the genesis of, of, of the book? I, I assume the idea came out of your last book, The Geography of Genius. Is that is that correct? Um, sort of. I, I would say, first of all, thank you, Tom, for the compliment. I appreciate that very much. Um, I, I would say that I, I sort of had a hunger pain one morning, uh, not for food, but for something. And, uh, you know, like most people, I reach for this little gadget, my iPhone, uh, to satisfy any itches I might have. And, you know, it's a remarkable device. With the swipe of my finger, I can access, you know, pretty much all of human knowledge from the ancient Egyptians to theoretical physics. Uh, and it'll give me a lot of information, but it won't give me wisdom. And it dawned on me that that's what uh, I was hungry for. And that's what I think a lot of people are hungry for. And when we think of, okay, we want wisdom, what are the sources for it? For most people, it's either religion, which works for some people, but not for all. Uh, or it's, you know, pop psychology, social science, which again works for some people, but not all. But there's this ancient source of wisdom out there. It's been around for thousands of years, and it's called philosophy, which means from the ancient Greek word, philosophos, which means love of wisdom. And that's how the journey began, really, a, a, a deep dive into philosophy, but a certain kind of philosophy. You know, in the book, when you talk about information and wisdom, uh, I, I was reminded of something T.S. Eliot wrote 
you know, obviously long before the, the age of the internet, he said, where is the wisdom we've lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we've lost in information? Hey, where's the information we've lost in data? <laughs> I would <add laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, no. And you know, T.S. Eliot's not alone. Um, Arthur Schopenhauer, one of the philosophers that I encounter writing in the 19th century, essentially warned of the internet. He warned of seeking answers outside of yourself, reading too many books, always looking for the answer in a book, uh, and just translate, uh, or rather trans transfer the word book with the word internet, and you'll see that we have become sort of intellectually lazy in the way that Schopenhauer warned that, um, that we don't look for answers inside of ourselves. We don't really wrestle with questions. It's too easy to just Google an answer and be satisfied with that. So yeah, people have been warning about this for way before uh, Facebook and Twitter and the rest of it. Yeah. Uh, Schopenhauer is one of 14 philosophers uh, right. that you talk about in this book. And I'm curious how you came up with those 14. Very carefully, I would say, with great deliberation. Um, if you Google philosopher, uh, you will find hundreds, if not thousands, of possibilities. And um, I chose people who uh, spoke to me. Who, who who were fully human, I would say. They tended not to be academics. In fact, not a single philosopher, and this was not by intention, not a single philosopher that I encounter and write about in my book uh, was attached to a university on a full-time basis. They were all feral philosophers, and they were flawed human beings. These were not saints. I mean, Rousseau had uh, the rather odd habit of exposing his buttocks uh, in public, um, Schopenhauer talked to his poodle. Don't get me started on Nietzsche. These were odd ducks, <laughs> um, but they were wrestling with the big issues of practical philosophy. They were interested in philosophy, not for what's known as logic chopping or doing analytical tumbers, uh, somersaults, but rather uh, to lead a more meaningful life. So they all had that practical thread. They were all odd ducks. And, you know, I wanted a, a variety. So we've got everyone from Socrates writing in the 5th century BC to Simone de Beauvoir, who didn't pass away until 1985. And um, not only Western philosophers, um, because the West does not by any means have a monopoly on wisdom. So we also have Confucius and Gandhi and a little known uh, Japanese writer named Sei Shonagan. Yeah, and, and as you say in the book, the, they were more interested in the how questions than the why questions, right? Not not right. that focused on the cosmos, but on practical life. Right, and that started with Socrates, right? He, right. you know, he was not the first philosopher, but now the ones who came before him are are known as pre-Socratics. Yeah. It would be like if every travel writer who came before Tom Swick was a pre-Swickian, you know, that's sort of what, <laughs> what happened. And uh, Socrates uh, wondered, just like the philosophers before him, but he wondered not why, why is there something rather than nothing, or, you know, what is everything made of, what is the substance, but he wondered how, how can we lead a more meaningful life? And it was a real turn in philosophy. Um, it's been said of Socrates, he was the first one to bring philosophy down from the heavens and introduce it to people's homes. Um, and he did. And we unfortunately lost, I think, in the last few centuries, we, centuries we've lost largely that, that thread of, of the how-to nature of philosophy. Yeah. Before we get into the specific philosophers, I wanted to um, mention the structure of the book, which I think is brilliant the way it's divided into three sections and, and the chapters. And if you could just tell people about the structure and, and how you came up with that. Right. So each chapter is a, a how-to question. Uh, for instance, how to get out of bed like Marcus Aurelius, the Roman emperor, uh, how to fight like Gandhi, all the way up to how to die like Montaigne. So it's one philosopher answering one how-to question. And the three sections are dawn, noon, and dusk, uh, sort of mirroring the arc of a day. And there are certain questions, how-to questions, that are more vital to us in our youth, such as how to see, how to listen, how to walk. 
Uh, others that are more important in middle age, how to fight, how to be kind, how to pay attention to the small things. And then there are questions that really rise to the surface as we get a bit older, uh, how to have no regrets, how to cope, how to grow old, and yes, how to die. So that's it, it's sort of the arc of a day um, in that form. And I'm wondering, did that structure appear to you in the course of writing the book, or did you have that at the very beginning? I knew I wanted each chapter to begin with a how-to question. Mm -hmm. I really, I, I feel like too much of philosophy just sort of goes off in a million different directions. There's nothing to hold on to. And I wanted to have one central question for each chapter. Uh, then it was actually my editor's idea to arrange it into these three sections. So I have to give Ben Lona, my great editor at Avid Reader Press, uh, credit for that. But every book is a collaboration. And uh, it was a brilliant uh, insight on his part. So that's what we did. Yeah. Now, every chapter begins with you on a train. Right. Explain I, that. I, well, first of all, I love trains, as I believe you're a train lover. Um, I am. But I don't think you're a foamer, are you? No, no, not at all. all right. So a foamer is someone <laughs> who's um, a train nut, who basically loves locomotives and gauges and tonnage right. ratings and all the technical uh, ephemera of train travel. Um, I don't know. I could care less about that. Right. Um, what I like, and I think what you like, is the experience of riding a train. Um, I just find that I can think on a train. I cannot think on a bus. I cannot think on an airplane. I can think a little bit on a boat, but not much. Um, but I can think very well on a train. I can contemplate. And so the idea was to use uh, a series of train journeys as sort of the uh, intermission between each philosophical act. So it opens with me on a train, um, just like you're just boom. Like if it was a movie, it would be just quick, quick pan to Eric on a train. He's in Athens or he, he's riding the F train in New York. And it's a very specific moment in time where I'm having a thought, I'm wrestling with an idea or the train's delayed, whatever it is. And um, it try, I'm trying to, like Socrates, bring the philosophy down to earth to keep it tethered. And the train sort of serves that function of moving us along in the journey, but also tethering us to the ground. And most of the time, it's obvious why you're on that train. You're taking, you know, the TGV from Paris to Bordeaux for your right. chapter on Montaigne. But that first chapter on Marcus Aurelius, you're on the Amtrak Empire Builder from Chicago to Portland. And I'm wondering why you chose that. Is it because of the name? Empire Builder. Oh, I didn't even think of that. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Did not even occur to me. Um, I didn't want this to be a point A to point B travel book, right? Mm -hmm. And I didn't want it to be a uh, chronological book order. We jump around from Marcus Aurelius in, you know, first century AD to Henry David Thoreau in, in the 1800s. Um, and I, I wanted these, these train journeys to sometimes be, yes, I'm going to see Athens, the birthplace of, of Western, democ Western democracy and philosophy. But other times you can be on Amtrak and have a thought where a Roman emperor named Marcus Aurelius is the one to answer it. Um, so the whole point of philosophy, in my mind, as I view it, is that it's portable, that wisdom is portable. If it wasn't portable and didn't uh, travel across time and space, and be of value, we wouldn't be here having this conversation, right? Because right. we're not talking about the uh, pharmacology of ancient Athens. We don't really want to go there. You don't want to be taking, for the most part, and there might be a few uh, herbal medicines that you can take, but you don't want that because that doesn't transport to our time. But the wisdom of, say, the ancient Greeks, is one example, does transport. Um, so that's why time, place, in a way, matters to me. In this book, it didn't matter in that linear sense. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. It does. Um, you know, the fact that every chapter begins with a how-to made me realize this, this is probably the world's most erudite how-to book. Um, with Socrates, you it's how to wonder like Socrates. And in that chapter, you you talk about the difference between wonder and curiosity. And I found that very interesting. Could you kind of expand right. on they, that a little? We often conflate them, that wonder yeah. and curiosity are the same. We use them interchangeably. 
but I think I put wonder curiosity is high, but I would put wonder a, a, a notch higher. Um, curiosity has this restless and restive quality to it. When we're curious, uh, we're flitting around looking at the next shiny object. Oh, what's that over there? Um, curiosity killed the cat, right? Wonder didn't kill the cat. Uh, wonder has a more transcendent quality to it and a more contemplative quality. And also that sense of awe is implied in the word wonder that might be lacking in curiosity. So when philosophy, when, when Socrates rather said all philosophy begins with wonder, uh, I'd like to think he had, he had both meanings in mind. Wondering as in that simple curiosity, I wonder, um, you know, what would happen if I were to pick that rose petal and smell it to uh, the wonder of you smell it and it smells amazing and you just wonder what it is about the smell of a rose petal that can turn a miserable day into the best day of your life, that kind of wonder. So I think um, wonder has that sort of dual element that curiosity lacks. I wonder what Socrates would made of people who don't ask questions, you know, and I'm sure you've met people like that. They, they, have, they seem to have no curiosity or wonder. Yeah. Uh, French philosopher named Maurice Reisling once said that uh, sooner or later, life makes philosophers of us all. I think those people are asking questions now, um, <laughs> given the time we're in. I, I, I think they are. Um, you're right. Some people are more people of the question than others. I don't think Socrates would think too highly of someone who didn't ask questions. Uh, he certainly didn't think highly of his fellow Athenians who seemed to have all the answers. Uh, and he was surprised at how little they actually knew and how they didn't know that they didn't know, right? So the, mm -hmm. the Oracle at Delphi proclaims that Socrates is the wisest man in all of Athens. And Socrates hears this news. He's like, no, this, this can't be. I really, I don't know much. I'm a stone cutter son and what do I know? But he goes around Athens and he starts uh, asking like a general to explain what courage is. The general can't really, or a poet to explain what beauty is and the poet can't. And he he, he realized that, it, as he put it, at least I know what I don't know. <laughs> and, and that for him, and I think still for philosophy today, is the beginning of this experience of philosophy. And it really is an experience, it's an activity. It's not a thing you possess. It begins with knowing what you don't know. Do you know what I mean? I do. I think okay. I do. I think you do. All right. Good. Yeah. Speaking of, of, of questions, uh, you know, as I was reading this book, I had a number of them. And, and one popped up in the chapter on Schopenhauer. And I found him a really interesting philosopher. Um, as you write, he, he found that life was wretched. And there were two uh, escapes we, right. we could uh have to get away from that. One was a life of asceticism, where we fast and we're celibate and everything. Not so attractive, that one. And the other was art. Um, right. And, you know, he said that he talked about art and not as something that conveys sentiment, but a form of knowledge, that it transcends passion. And I, right. I read that and I wondered, well, does that mean we're wrong to feel moved by a work of art like Michelangelo's Pieta or Beethoven's Ninth? Um, no, he he would say you should be moved, but you're you're moved not by. Um, uh, let's take a piece of classical music. I don't know many, but one I happen to know is is Samuel Barber's Adagio for Strings, right. which is your go to. Sad no, music, yeah. right? Um, and uh, Schopenhauer would say, when you listen to that and you feel sad, you're it's not the same as feeling sad because you didn't get the job you wanted or your wife of 30 years left you. You're able to experience that sadness or beauty, if it's a beautiful song, in a in a more pure form because you're not wrapped up in the story of it, the narrative mm -hmm. of the sadness. So he thought it was the quintessence of the emotion, sort of the pure emotion is what you're able to experience. And um, he did think that uh, the arts, in particular music, uh, allowed us to transcend this otherwise miserable world uh, ruled by this thing called the will, which is sort of like gravity, this all in, in evasive, invasive force 
um, but negative, but we can escape it through art and particularly through music. And if you've ever listened to a beautiful piece of music or played music, um, you probably know that that you forget time and space for a while. You forget your worries. Um, and he thought it was a temporary condition. Eventually we snap at it and we come back to this miserable world. But I found it interesting that even this philosopher of pessimism, which he was, he developed a whole metaphysics of misery. Um, even he saw uh, a way out, right? He had a bright spot. And the bright spot was either the way of the monk or the way of the musician, essentially. Mm -hmm. I'll take the way of the musician or the music yeah. lover. At least. Yeah, another thing that surprised me, uh, the chapter on Epicurus, uh, right. who, if I read it correctly, saw pleasure as something that's really a lack, an absence of... Well, well uh, let's back things. up for a second. And, and Epicurus is probably a name that's familiar to um, listeners and readers out there. Um, in that, I mean, you'd heard of Epicurus, had you not? Of course. Yeah. Right, but he's but he's he's associated with pleasure in a sort of hedonistic way, isn't he? And in the mm -hmm. website Epicurious, and if you're an Epicurean, small e Epicurean these days, you're considered someone who's a gourmand and and really likes fine right. wine and food, right? And that's sort of what I thought until I investigated and found that he's really the exact opposite. I mean, all philosophers are misunderstood. He's m more misunderstood than most, and he really thought that pleasure was, as you say, an absence, not a presence of something, but an absence of suffering. Ataraxia is the ancient Greek word. And it means essentially that you're not disturbed by anything. And at first we think, you know, I thought, is this really what pleasure is? Isn't it more a presence, more active? But the more you think about it, you think about that transcendent state of peace of mind that you may have experienced. It's really not what's happening at that moment, but what, what's not happening. That might explain it. You're not having disturbed thoughts. Um, you're not having. You're not stuck in traffic. You're not at work. Right. Um, and it's a, it's a different way of looking at pleasure, um, both different from this image of the gourmand, and even different from someone who most of us who pursue pleasure as this thing we want to acquire, like knowledge. And Epicurus would say no to both. I found it interesting that that chapter is followed by one on Simon Bay, the French writer and thinker, who experienced very little pleasure in her life. In fact, she was someone who could experience the pain, feel the pain of other people to a, a very high degree. And I wondered if, if there was, if you did that juxtaposition on purpose, following again, Epicurus with Simon I, again, Bay. I would have to say that it was not on purpose. Um, I sort of arranged the chapters by my gut, and mm -hmm. uh, you're, I like how you're pointing out <laughs> the brilliance of my design that I didn't <laughs> even know. Um, I, I, I sort of went with my gut in terms of the pacing and where everyone fit into the book without considering time or place, really. Um, but you're right, now that you mention it. Um, Simone Weil, who's a, not a very well-known figure, uh, unfortunately, I think she should be better known, writing yeah. in the in the tw early tw to mid 20th century, uh, a gifted, extremely gifted child. She was reading uh, Pascal by the time she was 10. She was fluent in Assyrian Babylonian by age 15, and an amazing student in this incredibly intellectual family. But as you say, radically empathetic. I mean, empathetic to the point where when she was six years old, she refused to have any sugar because the poor French soldiers right. standing at the front of World War One didn't have sugar. And she slept on hard floors and she may have been anorexic. There's a lot of debate about that. Um, she was not a, a pleasure seeker, certainly in the small e Epicurean way. Um, you but quote, she was a very spiritual figure, as you know. Yes, yes. And you quote her saying, uh, or having written, we don't obtain the most precious gifts by going in search of them, but by waiting for them. And when I read that, I wondered, that sounds like an invitation to laziness or inaction. Well, yeah, how, how, do you, how um, do you see that? I think that would be a common misreading of her um, and one that I was guilty of at first until you dig a little deeper. Um, what she's talking about is a receptivity that is both 
active and passive. Um, in the way radar is that it's receiving signals, but it's sending out signals so it can ping and come back. And we focus almost exclusively on the sending out of a signal or a sonar works the same way. Uh, we don't focus on the waiting for something to come back part. Um, so we tend to go after things. Um, attention, for instance, is her, her chapter is called How to Pay Attention. And this is a subject that she wrote and thought a lot about. And she thought that we conflate attention and concentration um, and that they're very different. She thought concentration was ridiculous. That if you concentrate on something, you narrow your gaze, mm -hmm. you tighten your jaw, clench your teeth, furrow your brow. And she thought this was not the way to receive anything uh, and to really be attentive uh, the way a radar dish is attentive or the way um, just a person who goes through life really paying attention, not, you know, only paying attention to what matters to them, but paying attention to the unexpected idea that might be floating out there that would come to you where you're not concentrating on something else if you were receptive to it. So right. I, I think it, it's a kind of passive, an active passivity in a way, which sounds like one of those crazy contradictions that philosophers speak in. And I, re, right. I told myself I wouldn't speak that way, but it is an active passivity that she's speaking of. You know, Eric, as, as I was reading the book, I was wondering, I wonder which one of the these philosophers speak to Eric the most clearly. Um, you said at the beginning that you pick all philosophers to speak to you. Right. And but then I think I found the answer when I read the chapter on Gandhi and then the chapter on Montaigne. Um, those yeah. two seem to be the ones that you you relate to the, the strongest. I, I think you're spot on. Um, okay. Montaigne, I, I, I say so, I think explicitly in the book, he's the philosopher I'd most want to have a beer with um, because he's, you know, he's writing in the 16th century, but he's... Um, He's filled with uh, he's filled with doubt, uh, but he sort of owns that doubt. Um, his motto was "What do I know?" which uh, doesn't sound like a uh, very good motto for someone who's going to be known as a famous philosopher, but it, it took him far. Um, we only have flutterings of the mind, he said, and, and but these flutterings can take us a long way. And he he wrote his essays. He invented the form, the essay. And if you read them, they start off a little tentative. He's not really putting the first person in there too much. And as he goes on, he gets a little gutsier, a little bolder to write about himself. And it sort of mirrors my career as a first a journalist, just the facts, ma'am. And uh, then I started to write books where I would insert myself. And now I'm not afraid to, to use the first person pronoun. And um, I respected Montaigne for for making philosophy personal. Um, and Gandhi, I, we could talk for hours about Gandhi. I, I lived in India. I've read um, a lot of what Gandhi has written and what's been written about him. I've been to his ashrams. Um, I, have a, uh, I have a Gandhi wallet um, right here in my pocket. There's the key right there. Okay, so, and uh, I am wearing a pair of uh, Gandhi boxer shorts. Um, okay. uh, you take my word for that, okay? I, I do because that that is a very moving chapter. Um, I, I found the ending very touching. I mean, part of it is because of your relationship with your friend Kalish, Kalash, Kalash, yeah. Kalash, um, who began as your servant when you were right. working for NPR in in India. It's it's a very moving chapter, and um, yeah, I I uh, I could see how you felt very much attached to Gandhi. The other chapter I found moving, but kind of thrilling, was the chapter on um, Nietzsche. That, Nietzsche. That yeah. Was, yeah, that was uh, really he's, um, interesting. Yeah, um, some people say that they they some people have a very visceral reaction to Nietzsche. They don't they don't like. And he was him. all about visceral, right? He was all. He was the philosopher <laughs> of the visceral. If, if Rousseau yeah. was the philosopher of the heart, uh, and Descartes was the philosopher of the brain. Nietzsche was the philosopher of the viscera. And the exclamation point, he loved exclamation points. He'd string three of them together sometimes. He was, um, 
he uh, thought the way most people felt, you know, the way we have a feeling it's kind of just from our gut and it just comes out. And that's the way he thought, actually. And um, a lot of misunderstandings about him, too. He was not a Nazi, he died in 1900, well before the Nazi party came along. He was not an anti-Semite. His sister was, and she was a friend of the Nazis, certainly, um, but she outlived him, unfortunately, and, and kind of marred his reputation. But he he had a lot of fascinating ideas. The one that I focus on, of course, is eternal recurrence, this idea right. that, that the universe and our lives repeat themselves over and over again, forever. Um, if you've ever seen the movie Groundhog Day, that yeah. is a version of eternal recurrence. Eric, you wrote this book, obviously, before the pandemic, uh, before the civic unrest that we're having now. I'm wondering which philosophers you see as, as most relevant to what's happening now, to anything, any Definitely particularly stand good out? Good question. Um, some of the older ones, actually. Um, Socrates, in terms of questioning our assumptions, um, you know, we go through life with a lot of assumptions like clothing that, you know, is in our closet that we don't know how it got there, but we put it on every day. We don't give it a second thought about, do I really want to be wearing this shirt? I do want to be wearing this shirt, but do you really want to be wearing those glasses? Do you really, you know, we, 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 we don't question our assumptions. The pandemic has forced people, I think, to question assumptions. And I think that's a good thing. And Socrates would approve. Uh, another going back to ancient times would be the Stoics. Yeah, I mean they they are the philosophy for tough times and hard knocks, and you don't get any tougher and harder than now. And uh, th they lived, of course, during some very difficult, uncertain times. And Stoic philosophy can be summed up um, in the the first page of a little book called the Handbook by a philosopher named Epictetus, and it says very simply: some things are up to us, and some aren't. That's basically it. Step two would be worry about the things that are up to you. Don't worry about the things that aren't. Yeah. It's incredibly simple, which is, I think why it is, is so appealing. Stoicism, even before the pandemic, was making something of a comeback, particularly in Silicon Valley among the, the techies out there, but all sorts of people, because it teaches us that we can't control outside circumstances, but we can control the internal. And we don't need to react uh, in a negative way to negative to so-called negative circumstances. That's a value judgment we make. You you quote a, a letter that Simone Bay wrote when she was in England during the war, and she wrote, "People's nerves are torn, but they control them out of self-respect and a true generosity towards others." And I thought of that in our silly battle over wearing face masks, you know. Um, and that, she was that's... writing during World War II. In, exactly. In, in England, in London. And I love, right? I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, she was right, living in London, yeah, writing right. during World War II. She fell in love with the, the English. And um, yeah, but you were saying that's contrast to what's happening in our country today. Yeah, and I love the, the use of the word generosity. Not, you know, mm -hmm. she didn't mention concern for others or consideration of others, but generosity, which seems like a richer and, and fuller uh, and word. She and then was, she was a generous spirit. So yeah, yeah, she was. And then there's this line from C Confucius that um, I couldn't help but uh, it reminded me of what's going on uh, right now. Kindness is the basis for governance. Yeah. Mm. So Confucius didn't invent kindness. It had been around before he came along, but the idea of kindness as a governing principle was new. And uh, he thought um, living during the time of the warring states in China, uh, that kindness would take a leader further than uh, cruelty. And uh, he traveled around for some 13 years around China, different states, which were sort of self-governing, looking for a ruler who would take him on, you know, in his new philosophy of kindness, uh, governing through kindness, and, and none would. <laughs> so he went back home and he taught, and um, and uh, thank God he didn't get that job, or we might not know him today. But, um, you know, the opposite would probably be Machiavelli, right, on the other end of the spectrum. Yeah. But uh, I, I think, um, I, yeah, Confucius and kindness are certainly relevant to our times. 
Here's a non-philosophical question, or maybe not. Um, you went to most of the places and most of the countries the philosophers were from, with the exception of two, uh, Italy and China. Any reason? I didn't, um, you know, I didn't want to be predictable. Again, I didn't want to be bounded by time and space. And I thought if I'm going to walk the walk to show that these philosophies are portable, um, I, I don't need to necessarily go to Rome to look at a statue of Marcus Aurelius. Um, let's face it, there's not much left of, of his Rome, at least. Right. Um, uh, I didn't need to do that. If it was more relevant to go to Stoic camp in Wyoming, uh, I would go, and I did. Right. Um, and uh, China, I, I've been to China before. I've written from China about China. Um, I actually thought riding the F train in New York and going small and trying to find kindness in the New York City subway, uh, an underground uh, Dantean hell that people would think is the least kind in the world, that if you can find it there, you can find it anywhere. And, um, you know, I, I, I wanted to, to go small and I wanted to mix it up. And, uh, yeah. And you also found benevolence in a Chinese restaurant, which I found interesting. Because as you begin that, that passage, uh, a lot of us find Chinese restaurants a little brusque. Right. They, they bark at you and say, how many people yeah. you sit down? And, you know, and yeah. they throw you in a table with a bunch of strangers and they want you to order quickly. But if you look at it, you know, there's sort of a, a certain generosity of spirit there. There's a, um, a familiarity, an informality. Um, there's a convivialness of being, you know, seated with people who you don't know. Um, and if you eat quickly and move along, you know, others can eat too, um, who are waiting right. outside in the cold. So there's a kindness there as well. Um, it, you know, just to, to tie that in with the sort of theme of my book is that it depends how you look at it. So it really, mm -hmm. your question was philosophical. Mm -hmm. um, it depends how you look at it. And we think of philosophy as one role, of, or maybe the role of philosophy is an agent of truth, a vehicle to the truth, a one that's inferior to science now. But of course, science used to be part of philosophy. But if you look at philosophy as... Uh, it's been called, uh, someone's called it life enriching poetry, life mm. enriching poetry. It takes on a different hue and a different character. So if you read a good novel, Tom, you put it down, you'll see the world differently for a few days, at least, you know, it will stay with you. And I think a good piece of philosophy has its same effect. You see the world a bit differently and hopefully it lasts for more than just a few days. Well, that certainly happened uh, for me with your book. So um, well, my now, work here is done. <laughs> now, uh, let me, I have some more questions, but let me see if there are any, I just clicked on ask a question and I don't see any, but I would think, I don't know, maybe I'm not getting the right section. Well, let me try again. So I can see that there are a lot of people watching. But they're very shy. <laughs> okay, there are no so questions me, then. They're not let asking say, anything. Let me say something about Yet. that then. Um, <laughs> is that um, I asked my uh, my daughter, who was 13 years old at the time, um, you know, I sort of enlisted her into my philosophical journey. I said, is there is there such a thing as a dumb question? And she thought about it. And she said, well, only a you know, question ah, that you, know, just, the, that, that, you, you know, just the answer to already. So <laughs> this is my invitation to say, um, unless you're answer, asking a question, you know, the answer to already, there are no dumb questions. And the art of philosophy is about asking questions. So you just got questions. one. Let's okay, see a here's a question, Eric, which was more fun to write, the Socrates Express or the geography of genius? Ah, uh, I'm going to go with the Socrates Express, and not only uh, because it's my most recent book, um, but because I could really wade into the world of ideas, um, and uh, and I just I sort of fell in love with the characters I wrote about in the Socrates Express a bit more. In the Geography of Genius, I fell in love with the places, you know, Renaissance Florence. Um, 
or Edinburgh in the 18th century. I fell in love with those places, but in the Socrates Express, I fell in love with these characters, a lot of them anyway. So I'm going to go with Socrates. Okay, there's another question uh, asking if there's a chapter on Descartes and asking you what uh, your thoughts on his ideas. Uh, there is not a chapter in Descartes. Right. He makes a couple of cameo uh, appearances. Uh, he famously said, I think, therefore, I am, uh, meaning essentially that I am, a, I can, he, he wanted to, he stopped and thought, what can I really know? What does anyone really know for sure? Do I really know anything or is, is all knowledge sort of, are we, are we blank slates and it just, you know, enters our brain once we're, once we're born? And he thought, well, if I can ask that question, that means I exist. And he was uh, a rationalist. He believed uh, in rational thought. He believed that um, we know the world through reason and reason alone, pretty much. And I don't subscribe to that. I guess I'm more of an empiricist that we get our knowledge through our senses. And, um, and so I did not include a full chapter on Descartes. Um, yeah. Okay, here's another question uh, from Valerie. What did you find to be the most valuable piece of wisdom in the writings you studied for the book? Oh, boy. <laughs> um, getting back to what I said earlier about seeing the world otherwise. You know, Henry David Thoreau uh, would look at the world at angles, right? He is best known as the author of Walden Pond, where he conducted his experiment in isolation, in quotes. Um, but really, when I investigated, I think he was about seeing the world differently. And he would look at, say, Walden Pond from different angles, from top of a hill, he'd get on a rowboat and look at the pond from there, he'd dive underwater, and he'd even put his head down between his legs, inverted, and look at the pond upside down. And it was all about seeing the world a little bit differently. And he said, if you, if you change your perspective just a little bit, Miracles will happen, and every drop in a storm, he said, will look like a rainbow if you do that. So um, I think that's the valuable, most valuable piece of wisdom I picked up, is that by looking at the world, our life, our lives slightly differently, um, by reframing certain problems. Um, Epictetus, the Stoic, talked a lot about this. He said, you know, if you find yourself stuck in a in, in a crowd in a traffic jam essentially <laughs> um look at it as a chance to hang out with people and have fun it's a party i mean reframing everything and uh that's not delusional that's um disillusioning that is um disillusioning ourselves in a good way that we're walking around with certain illusions about the way the world is and we can change our perspective slightly Good. There's another question. Um, are there, Fast and yes. Furious. Are there any philosophers or chapters you had to take out of the book from a first draft? Who would you like? Ooh, boy. Who would you like to add if you That's could? A good question. I did kill off a philosopher. Oh no. Um, yeah, Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard. Oh yeah. Yeah, I went all the way to Copenhagen and spent some time there and paddled in his footsteps and. I, uh, and I read about him and I read him and I couldn't make that leap of faith that he <laughs> that he uh, spoke so famously about. Um, Joe Biden likes to quote Kierkegaard a lot these days, particularly his his quote saying that uh, faith sees best in the darkness. Um, I, I couldn't I couldn't nail down Kierkegaard. So I I. Um, uh, I have to give him the axe, and I feel I feel guilty about that, Tom. Um, but yeah. um, but you know, it's been said that a piece of writing is never finished, only abandoned. You know, you're just like time's up. Who made who who gets to stay on the island and who gets off and Kierkegaard off the island? Yeah. <laughs> uh, another question. Uh, this is a good one. I like. Uh, should a student study philosophy in college? Well, I say that no one uh, studies philosophy if their parents can help it. Um, <laughs> uh, in all well, serious, go ahead. Well, the different, I think I, I would make a distinction between study philosophy and major in philosophy, maybe. Okay. I, I would say everybody should study philosophy. Right. It's sort of like saying, should you exercise your body? 
So you do right. any physical activity. Uh, you may not be on a sports team in college, but you should do physical activity. And again, if philosophy is an activity, and it, I really believe it is, then you you need to study it. Um, and, um, you know, it, it's a shame that philosophy has become this subject that people consider something hard and difficult, sort of like integral calculus, only with words instead of numbers. It didn't used to be that way. It doesn't need to be that way. And I hope my book in some small way um, brings philosophy back to its original purposes, medicine for the soul. That's what the ancient Greeks considered it. Yeah, no, I think it, I think your book will help, definitely. Um, I have another question sure. from me. Um, the book has a very strong and very attractive memoir quality. Uh, you mentioned that you don't fear writing in per first person anymore. And so you, you appear in the book um, again and again, and in very, uh, I think, illuminating ways. And we get to know you just as we get to know the philosophers. And what we learn about you, well, one thing we learn about you is you're not old, right? No, not. You're not old. No, yeah, I other thing we, <laughs> the other thing other, we learn about- Other people, other people are old. Right, yeah. right. Um, we also learn that you're prone to bouts, occasional bouts of melancholy. Uh, you sometimes get frustrated over little things. Um, and I'm wondering if researching and writing this book had any uh, had any effect on your basic nature? If you if you changed it all, you think um, as a result of, of this book? Yeah, I early on. Um... I went into a, uh, a bookstore, not books and books. Um, this was when I was beginning research. Um, and there were two sections. There was the, uh, one section was called self-transformation and the other was called philosophy. And they were two different sections. Um, in the books and books of ancient Athens, um, that would be the same section, that philosophy was self-transformation. That was the, the purpose of it. It was also a societal transformation. It was also intellectual knowledge for knowledge's sake. It was all these things. So um, that is the point. But it, it let me answer the question more directly. I haven't arrived at mental full mental health yet, if that's what you're getting at. But I do think I am less mentally unhealthy than I was before I wrote the book. Um, I think I do have that ability to see things otherwise, to question my assumptions, to see beauty uh, where I didn't see it before, to appreciate the small, like say Shon again, we haven't talked about her, the right. 11th, uh, 11th century uh, Japanese writer, to see beauty in the small, which I did, never did before. So in small ways and big, I, uh, I have changed. Um, but the we started off with talking about the meaning of the word philosophy, the love of wisdom, a philosopher is a lover of wisdom. It doesn't say anything about acquiring it any more than the Declaration of Independence says anything about acquiring happiness. It doesn't guarantee it. It's life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Mm -hmm. So just as uh, lazy travel writers will say, it's not the destination, it's the journey. Um, and uh, like most cliches, it has the advantage of being true. Um, likewise, you can love this pursuit of wisdom without fully arriving there. Boy, that's a long answer to a short question, but there you go. Here's a question that will probably warrant uh, an even longer answer, and it's from uh, my good friend Dan Laskin in Gambier, Ohio. He wants you to talk about Stoic Camp in Wyoming. Yes, Stoic Camp in Wyoming. I saw an ad for it little black and white ad somewhere. It said, come to the Snowy Range Mountains in Wyoming and get happier, basically, something like that. <laughs> Be less neurotic is how I read it. And I thought this is what I needed. Um, and so one of the precepts of Stoicism is to live in accord with nature. And so there's a, a wonderful philosophy professor at the, at the University of Wyoming named Rob Coulter, um, big bear of a guy, Santa Claus of a guy, and a uh, great guy. And he thought, well, we've got a lot of nature out here in Wyoming. Damn it, let's have a stoic camp here. 
And he started it a few years ago and, you know, everyone in his department thought he was nuts. You know, no one's going to come to Wyoming for stoic camp, but they have every year an ongoing thing. And it's, you're, you're in the boonies. It's not comfortable because it's stoic camp. Uh, no one's complaining because it's stoic camp. Um, and we sit around every day in these uncomfortable plastic chairs, uh, drinking uh, lukewarm coffee out of styrofoam cups and reading the greats, reading Epictetus in his handbook reading Marcus Aurelius and his meditations and, kind of, and wrestling with these ideas, not the meaning of life. Who cares about that? It's leading a meaningful life. How can we, mm -hmm. right? And and it was a great experience, even though it was uncomfortable, I should add. Um, it was great because how rare it is to sit around like we're doing now and to talk about what matters. How can we not just how can we be happier, how can we be wealthier, but how can we lead a richer life? Like what, what should we do really to hit that pause button? And that's what they did in ancient Athens for apparently a lot of the time. Um, and then they got into a, a mess with invaders because I guess they were thinking too deeply, but never mind that. They, um, they actually thought it was important to do what we're doing now on more or less a full-time basis. And Stoic camps are open to anyone. Um, you, yep. you go to Google Stoic Camp in, in Wyoming, the Snowy Range Mountain, Rob Coulter. Sign up. I'm sure Rob will be back there next year. Um, you don't, this is, this, that was the whole Rob's point and my point in writing this book is you don't need to be a philosopher to do philosophy. You don't need to be a professor of philosophy or enrolled in a university to do philosophy. Um, sooner or later, life makes philosophers of us all. Welcome to Sooner. So start philosophizing. You could start with my book, I might add. Yes, that'd be a good place. Um, here's another question, Eric. Uh, one that I, I, another question I like. What's the connection between travel and philosophy? It's a good question. Um, mm -hmm. One of my favorite travel quotes, I probably overuse it at this point, and I'm sure you've heard it's from Henry Miller. And he said, one's destination is never a place, but a new way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. Same with philosophy. Your destination is not knowledge, um, not a place like knowledge, but a new way of looking at things. And really, we the part of us that wants to travel and the part of us that wants to do philosophy, it's coming from the same place. And that's that desire to see things otherwise. And so when we travel, we don't want to go to a place exactly like our hometown where the people are exactly like our neighbors. We want to see the different, not so different that we don't recognize it, but different enough to see the world otherwise. And that's really what philosophy, I think, is, as I define it, is about, about seeing the world otherwise. So, um, and they both, um, they both involve some discomfort. They both involve encounters with strangers. Um, and uh, we can't do much travel right now, but we can do plenty of philosophizing. So. All right. Do you have another book in the works? Working on several ideas. Um, I, I tend to, okay. some authors have the problem of not enough ideas. Mine is too many. Um, so I'm not prepared to say what it is now, mm -hmm. but I will be publishing another book with, with Avid Reader Press, which is part of Simon & Schuster. Um, and we are thinking what it will be and what kind of book can a travel writer write when he can't travel. That's one issue. And um, your daughter, plays a role in the book. You take her to France um, yes. for the chapters on Simone de Beauvoir and Montaigne. Um, I'm curious, did you show her what you wrote before the book was published? I did not show it to her. I told her she would be in the book. Um, when she was 12 or 13, that just, she didn't care. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now she does. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I think she likes that she, uh, if, if you read it, you know that she comes across as my foil and right. she comes across as uh, wise and she is wise. Um, someone once called a philosopher a seven-year-old with a bigger brain. Um, she's now a 15-year-old with a bigger brain. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, one other, I think we still have a couple of minutes. Um, 
I noticed that almost half of the philosophers in the book, six of the 14, come from two countries, Greece and France. And as the author of a book, The Geography of Genius, I wondered what you made of that. Is that right? We've got Simone Weil, Simone de Beauvoir, Montaigne. Montaigne, and then uh, Epicurus, Socrates, and right. Epictetus. Right, and Marcus Aurelius was from nearby Italy. Um, right. Which is really part of the Greco-Roman world. Right. Um, yeah, and relatively few, well, two Germans. Um, you know... Um, the, the West, no, no one place has a monopoly on wisdom and on philosophy. It's it's practiced everywhere. There's there's African philosophy. There's all sorts of philosophy. But Western philosophy began in Athens. And in Geography of Genius, I write extensively about why I think that is, what it was about Athens that lent itself to that flourishing of, of genius. Um, France... Um, the French are pretty philosophical people, you know, yeah. in, uh, in high school in France, it's required, it's a requirement to take at least one semester of philosophy. Why don't mm -hmm. we do that here? I don't know. But yeah. they do that in France. And I think um, both are cultures that, that slow down and pause. You've spent time in France, you know about the cafe culture and cafe life. And... Um, and 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 this this asking questions about why uh, is is big in France. It, it it is a thread that runs through French culture. And philosophy is not a four letter word in France today, the way it, it is unfortunately in this country. Yeah, and if our schools want to start with that um, French study of philosophy, this would be a good book to. Begin with, I think. Can I, can I see that book again? Was that yes, book? yes. Oh, yeah, that's it. That would be an excellent <laughs> way to start. That's the one. And that's the perfect segue into um, reminding you that you can order the book by just pressing the green button at the bottom of the screen. It's a fabulous book. You it really is. need it in your library. You need it in your in your mind and in your soul. So please order away and what a fantastic conversation thank you so much i wonder um if there are any like aside from your book are there are there key works of philosophy key books that you might recommend um as a bookseller you know uh, are me. there yeah. <laughs> you yes. yeah it's just i've got the books and books t-shirt and on. i can't, um, can't thank yeah, you there, enough there, for wearing i'm going to mention a couple oh. um because uh, people ask me that um, one is to, to read, it's very accessible, Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. Um, no, I've got a uh, copy somewhere on my bookshelf, but uh, there's a new translation that's out uh, by Hayes, H-A-Y-S, I forget his first name, that I found that translation very good. It's very accessible, very readable, Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Um, there's a nice accessible book called The Heart of Philosophy by Jacob Needleman. And he makes an appearance. He's one of the char contemporary characters in my book. I, I quite like that one. Something a little more rigorous by a French, of course, uh, philosopher Oops. named Pierre Adot. It's spelled H-A-D-O-T. Uh, is um, uh, I forget the title of it, but it's about uh, practical philosophy, essentially, and um, very accessible as well. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, there. I think in, in the back of the book, I have not a straightforward bibliography, but a further reader, reading section broken down by each chapter. So if you want to read more Simone Weil or read about her, mm -hmm. you just go to that section uh, and you can find those those books to read. Um, That's great. But um, they, they, they are out there. Um, not uh, There are philosophers who wrote in plain language and clear English, and, and they're a joy to read. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't know if you remember, Eric, that um, you were the very first author who read at our Grand Cayman store. Do you remember yes. that? I, how could I forget that? <laughs> what okay. year would that have been? Um, it's going back a few years, but I remember my publicist at the time said, I've got to join you on this trip. You might need this help on this trip. I'm like, really? Carrie okay. Goldstein. Yeah. Carrie Goldstein. Shout out to Carrie. Um, that was... Um, 
that was one of the great book reading experiences of my life. How, that store is still open? And, and It's still uh, open, okay. yeah. Uh, I just want you to know, Christina, that I am available for readings in the Cayman Islands. <laughs> Uh, I think my publisher maybe is, maybe Key Lee. West maybe Key West this time. <laughs> Key, do you have Key West? Yes, yes. It's owned by Judy Bloom, um, and her husband George. And yeah. so, it's a lovely store. Yeah, yeah. we would what love to have you West there. West in the literary life. I mean, not just Hemingway. That's a whole other conversation. So true. What's this, what's this yeah. connection? Yeah, I really enjoyed the conversation, Tommy. I just want to I want to thank you for for reading it so uh, generously if you know what I mean, uh, and for asking great questions and um, and being so Socratic about everything. I, I could have <laughs> talked for another three hours. Yeah, I and could have too. There, there were a lot of questions I didn't get to ask, but thank you for writing such a wonderful book. You're welcome. Thank you to all of our viewers watching from wherever you're watching. Thank, thank you so for much. joining us tonight. Thanks for wearing that t-shirt. I love <laughs> it. I love it. I wear it all the time. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we will see you again soon. Yes. In I person hope. next time. In, In person. person. Yeah. Until then. Take care. Au revoir.